Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our Heavenly Father's house. We will begin our worship singing this morning with our choir singing from the celebration hymnal 28 at the name of Jesus. We will continue our singing together as a congregation from the hymnal number 20, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, and the words will be on the screen.
In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear awesome Heavenly Father, we rejoice to be here in your house, to come close to you, our God, the creator of everything, and the one who knows us intimately. We rejoice and, and thank you, Father, that, that you are always present, that your love is so great, that you welcome us back. No matter what has happened in our lives, you draw us back to you, ready to, to embrace us. And we're glad that we can come as a congregation united to hear your word, to be able to have a new understanding. Father, there are many who come heavy laden, those who have concerns, those who have worries, who have doubt. You see it all. Nothing is hidden from you, and we lay these worries, these concerns, these doubts at your feet, seeking now your help, seeking this word of upliftment, of strength. Provide it, Father. Provide this moment with you, this, an experience that your Holy Spirit can be active through us through this morning that we can hear you, we can be drawn close and have a new understanding. And we also ask for your connection through the apostolate that we can be in oneness. And most of all, we pray that you will send your son, complete this work. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, blessed Sunday. We have a, uh, our Bible verse today out of the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, the 10th and the 11th verses. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. Congregation can be seated, and the choir will sing. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. How do you handle doubt? When God, when the plan that you think God has going on doesn't go the way you expect it to go, what do you do? Now you might say, well, I have a strong faith. I don't really doubt, right? We should always be believing. I might like to respond to that saying it's not really a question of if you'll doubt, it's rather a question of when that doubt will come. We have an amazing examples here of these apostles, these disciples, those who walked with Christ, those who were able to hear him talk and teach. And you think they, of all people, should not doubt. Yet, as we dig into today's sermon, we see that they did. Imagine spending years of your life leaving everything behind, and you follow this man who's amazing. 
giving you new understanding, perspective, teaching you, telling you of this beautiful kingdom that is here, that is coming now. And he's going to change everything. And then he dies. He's brutally beaten up, crucified, and dies. This person you're following who said everything was going to change. Yeah. Talk about a moment of shaking your faith. What do you do when life doesn't go as you expect? The way you think this God of love should handle this life around me. Maybe it's when you look out at the world and you say, look at this war that's going on. Wouldn't a God of love provide peace here? What's wrong with this picture? There's those who are starving. There's famine all over. Maybe the world is too far away and too, too, you don't come, uh, connect with that. Maybe let's take a little bit more personal. Maybe you, you say, well, Lord, like if you could just provide this next job opportunity, I, 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 it would help me provide for my family. It would allow me to serve you more. Come on, this, this is the right path. And it doesn't happen. What do you do? Maybe, maybe you have a desire for um, a family. For someone to love, maybe a child. And you're like, Lord, you want me to love? This would be a perfect way for me to show my love and practice it. And it doesn't happen. How do you handle that? Maybe you're suffering with an illness or a loved one who is sick. And you pray, Lord, provide your healing. This would be an amazing miracle to show your glory. And he doesn't. How do you handle that? Now, these disciples, they, they were strong believers. They believed in this picture, this painting that, that, that they saw that Jesus was giving to them of a, a kingdom where there was no pain, there was no hurt, and finally they wouldn't have to be under Roman oppression. And after then Christ dies, we, we read about them. They're basically huddled up in their home, afraid they were going to potentially be next to be crucified or die, uh, to be killed. But then how they respond to what comes next is, is interesting. There are several different ways that happen here. This central event in salvation history, resurrection, he told them it was coming. That's what's so crazy. They, he told them what was going to happen. But maybe they, they were just so in the moment so lost in their grief and their despair, they couldn't see it. And these, uh, these women, they were the first to go. Uh, there's a group of women, as we read, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women, depending on which gospel you read. There's another woman, uh, Salome. They were all going with these uh, spices to prepare the body of Jesus for the next part of, the, of, of a burial. So they, too, actually weren't expecting a risen Lord. They wouldn't be going with spices, right, to, to take care of him. And they come, and what do they witness? Not a dead body, but an empty tomb. And at first, they're afraid. They see these two uh, angels who help give them clarity and reorient themselves to, oh, oh, that's right. That is what Jesus said. They said uh, they were afraid. He says, he is not here. He's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. The son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And so they run. They run back. They're amazed. They run back to the disciples. And how do the disciples respond? If I were to put it in everyday language today, all these foolish women idle talk. What are, they, what, are, what are you speaking of? They say they, they did not believe him. They said, and their words seemed to them like idle tales. So the women's response as they experienced this was to run, take action, and to share this good news. Then they come to the disciples, and how do they reply? They respond. Well, at the very next verse, there is one or two different disciples that respond differently. The 12th verse says, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb. 
Now, it didn't say he believed when the women came, but he didn't sit there in his doubt, in his grief, sitting there in, in action, immobile. No, he stood up and he didn't walk, he ran. He put everything into seeking God. And then when he got there, he stooped down and he saw the linen clothes lying by themselves and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now, if you look at one of the other Gospels, John also ran with him. It talks about John actually beating him and he was the first one there. So Peter didn't stay. He took action. It doesn't actually say he believes here at this moment in time, but he marveled. He was amazed. He was like, wow, something is happening. But the rest of the disciples, they didn't do anything. They stayed right there, stuck. And some of them probably still in complete opposite of, what's the opposite of belief? Well, unbelief, yes. <laughs> no, this can't be. I don't believe it. Or even as we read about Thomas later, <laughs> even after more come to him with, we've seen the Lord. No. Not until I put my hands in his hands and his holes and see it for myself. How do you respond? How do you react when you're face to face with what doesn't, seem, doesn't make sense? When you are plagued, if I can use that word, with unbelief, with doubt. Are you immobile? Do you just stay and say, well, I don't know. Well, maybe if the Lord shows up <laughs> in front of me and, I, and then, then he can explain it all to me. Maybe you're the, like the women who, who they ha all they had to do was hear from something and then they're running and ready to share. I think maybe the most of us need to look, be more like Peter. You might not believe, might not make sense at first, but you seek him. You look for him. You look to understand it more. These, this, empty, this empty tomb, it's a, it's a fundamental element of our, our faith, the salvation history, the resurrection of Jesus. It's a, it's a powerful moment in time. And, and it's funny, you, you, no one really remembers where the tomb is because that was not really important. Because <laughs> they, they came, they experienced, they saw, they shared the word. It's like, Jesus isn't there anymore. And we might be even looking for answers in the wrong place, but rather to be seeking where the Lord is now, where he is active today. And do we let, it, do we let this good news change our life? We talk about uh, I, I've often a common phrase in other um, uh, other churches is a, my, your Jesus moment, your, your, your moment of, of transformation or testimony. And when you've been a Christian, maybe your entire life, it could be hard to have this aha moment. Like, oh yes, I see Jesus alive in my life. But are you looking for that experience? Have you ever sought an experience with the Lord? Or do you simply sit in the pew and say, Lord, all right, show up. Uh, I got a busy life, but, you know, yeah, show up on my time, on my Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Or are you seeking him, just like Peter, running after him every single moment of the day, saying, Lord, where are you now? I need you. He's there, waiting for us. If you look in Matthew 7, chapter 7, verse, ask and you shall find, or yes, ask and you shall Yes, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be open unto you. It's interesting that progression, ask and it'll be, be, be given to you. You'll be able to hear from him. I'm trying to remember that exact, I should probably look up right there, Matthew 7, 7. It's an interesting progression because you, first you want to, you, you ask for something, ask and it'll be given to you. Yes, given to you. But then to seek, eh, that's a, it's, it's something, it's a much more, it sounds like work to be frank. <laughs> you ever gone on a scavenger hunt 
I feel, I feel like the youth did it the other couple weeks, and they had to go all over uh, downtown looking for these clues. <laughs> Uh, for, for Easter, uh, for our kids, uh, they, we could live, my father always used to leave, leave little clues for us. We'd have to puzzle it out, figure out where do we go next to find the next few candies. Now, you get a little uh, reward each time, so you're like, oh yes, now I can want to look for the next piece. Every time we seek the Lord, he's ready to give us exactly what we need at that moment. Peter, for him, for to have that first realization, okay, the Lord's not here. I see it nicely folded up, and I've heard this gospel, and, and then he runs off. And later, later we read how uh, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. It doesn't actually talk about, uh, it says in the 34th verse, what that experience he had with Jesus, but he did. It was a slow progression for him. For each of us, it may be a little bit different of how we experience him, but are we looking for him? See, the tomb, in many ways for the women, they were coming with a certain expectation. They come with the spices, and now I'm going to prepare the Lord's body. But as soon as they got to the tomb, the empty tomb, it reoriented their whole view, their whole life. For that entire moment after, their entire life changed. When you come to God's altar... And, he's, and, and Jesus wants to, to share this word with you. Does it change you? Or do you go back out to the, uh, today and continue living this week like you lived last week? <clears throat> this word reorientation, I, I, I work with a lot of video stuff. And so there's a thing called a tripod. Anybody seen those? The three legs. And, and uh, you put a camera on the top. And if I'm out working in, in outside or other places, it's kind of annoying because you have to extend the legs uh, and get it just perfect to get it balanced. Otherwise, if you're watching a video this way, nobody likes watching or looking at pictures necessarily this way. So you have to get it perfectly balanced. And it can take a lot of finagling. I saw an ad for a self-articulating uh, tripod. And it had a motor inside of it. And so you just push a button, and then all the legs would just properly align themselves. I'm like, ooh, now that's nice. <laughs> I'll take one of those. I'd like to say that there's a self-aligning, reorienting button you can press for you to have a proper perspective on your life. There is not. You have to put the work in. You have to be able to come seek the Lord. And he will reorient. He will help you. If I want to take that analogy any further, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit helping you properly balance your life so you have the perspective of where everything is supposed to lay. Because it sometimes does not make sense. Just as these disciples, why did the Lord have to be crucified and die? It did after they started to marinate on what he was teaching them. All the words that he shared, later we read about it like, at that time we didn't understand, but later we did. I was talking with a sister before of how sometimes sin may blind us to the truth. When you're so in the moment, it's hard to look beyond to see this amazing God that, that is at work in our life. And today, again, we, we, the Holy Spirit is coming and speaking to us, saying, the Lord is coming again. The Lord is coming. He's, are you ready? Just as, as Jesus was saying to them, I think it was just like the week before, he said, I've got to go. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. On the third day, I'm going to rise again. They didn't get it. He was speaking these words. But it was as if this, this sin that we're all mired in, it would put blinders on them. It didn't make sense at that time. And if you ever feel as you are trying to seek the Lord, you're trying to progress in your faith, and it doesn't make sense, you're in good company. <laughs> you're in good company. These disciples, they struggled with it too. But it's worth the struggle. It's worth the work to seek the Lord. 
Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. Now, some will take those, verse, those verses and say, great. So if I ask for a million dollars, the Lord will provide. If I, not, uh, if, I, if I seek a good job, he'll give it to me. And when I you know, knock on the door for great things... All will be provided. What is it that you're seeking? Are we seeking him? Because if it is, then we will find him. If we are asking for eternal life, then it will be given to us. And if we are knocking for the, for the door to salvation, it will be opened. But this knocking, I suppose, if you look at it, I, I remember coming to visit somebody once, and uh, I think I had forgotten that I, would, that I had told them I was coming. And so I'm knocking, and I'm knocking, and no one's coming to the door. I'm like, wait, did I, did I tell them? I think I told them I was coming, right? And, I, and I'm knocking, and eventually I, they did come. But I could have left after like a couple knocks. You're like, oh, nope, okay, no one's here. Time, time to leave. Our theme for this year is around prayer. Prayer works. How many times are you praying? <laughs> are we ceaseless in our prayer? Are we ceaseless in knocking? Ceaseless in, in, in never giving up in seeking him. This being a, a powerful moment in, our, in salvation history, this empty tomb how does it reorient and change our life, the way we look at it, the way we, we understand it? I, I, I look at, again, these three ways we could reply and respond when we experience something in our life that just, it doesn't make sense. Do we immediately believe. I, I, there have been a few individuals I've met in my life that just believe, and I'm, I'm amazed by them. But they, they, no matter what happens in the life, it's like, no, I, I believe. And, I, and then I start to f sometimes feel inferior. <laughs> like, how can you believe without question? And I, I think that's may, potentially just a gift that they have received, a gift of faith, an unshakable faith. But if you don't have that unshakable faith, you're not bad. There's nothing wrong with you. It's the question is, if do you take the next step to be like Peter and to seek him, to look for him? For some of us, it takes more work. I was reading uh, about creativity. I'm in the video business, and I'm fascinated by it. And I was learning how some individuals they can close their eyes and see the picture. They can imagine it. It's vivid. And if anything, when they open their eyes, they can still see it and they can trace it. So animators or those who are drawing can, it's called hyper, uh, hyper, uh, the word is not coming to me. It's fascinating. They, they've done this research. But there's also people that when they close their eyes, they see nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. They, instead, they have this emotion, this, this feeling. The, the, the animator for, I think it was the, the Little Mermaid, was one of those. And he, had to, he just had this feeling, and he would just draw, and he would just draw. He had no idea what it was until after several iterations, this image started to appear. And until these uh, researchers and, and psychologists, those who were researching this concept, he thought that there was something wrong with him. He didn't talk about it. He's like, oh, I guess I'm just, there's something wrong with me. But then he was amazed. There's tons of people that have this opposite challenge. But they're not, there's nothing wrong with them. There's, they're not a bad artist or creative or anything. They're just different. And now they, they, they have a little bit more work to do, potentially, to, for it to come out and for it to work for them. For all of us in this, this body of Christ, each of us are unique different. God's created you special. And just because you might have to work a little bit harder in one area doesn't make it wrong or bad. The question is, do you still put the effort in to seek him, to look for him? And that is also why we're not alone in this journey of faith. 
if you struggle with when you read the Bible, or rather you struggle reading it, <laughs> try other formats. I, I'm an audio person. I, I will turn on the, the, the audio versions of the Bible and listen to it. If you, if you struggle with either of those, join a small group. Be able to talk with others. Have this live conversation. You can join our Sunday school and you can draw too if you want to be more kinesthetic. The ministers are here for, for this purpose, to be able to dig into it. Take advantage of everything God has given you to seek him. If you do, just as Peter did, you will find him. And you will find there is this beautiful future of eternal sal salvation and life with him. This resurrection that Christ brought was the first step. It's our clue. It's, it's our cornerstone. Seek him and you will find him an eternal life. Amen. Amen. I'm going to call on our uh, priest, uh, Jamie, to, to serve along if we have a verse. We can sing together as a congregation from the hymnal number 177. The words will be on the screen and we can all stand. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. It's nice to be together with you here this morning. And if you were sitting in the congregation, you might have been sitting there thinking, did Priest Ferguson forget that Easter was last week? Because the, the service was all about the resurrection, the resurrection of our Lord. And the feeling and the thoughts of those disciples that were first to encounter that. And I had to think as Priest Ferguson was talking about disbelief and confusion and not understanding. And I thought about something somebody said to me one time in a statement, that which we don't know, we have the privilege to believe. And as Christians, as New Apostolic Christians, we don't know everything. The Lord Jesus Christ hasn't revealed everything to us, but we have the privilege to believe in the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus, in the return of Christ, in our future. We had our, our Youth Thrive discussion this morning, and our discussion was all about salvation. And I asked the kids, I said, well, what's salvation? And one of the kids said, what, well, I asked them, I said, what does it mean? And one of the kids said, it means that I don't have to worry about tomorrow because God has my future all laid out. And I'm like, are you holding service this morning? <laughs> but my dear brothers and sisters, yes, we don't have to worry about tomorrow because our future is already planned out. That which we know and that which we don't know, we have the privilege to believe and have faith in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think about this, this story fascinates me actually, because, and I actually like the version that's in John a little bit better because it has this story of Mary. It was focused on Mary Magdalene. And Ma Mary Magdalene standing there looking in the tomb and if I'm trying to put myself into her shoes, 
she's only seeing what's before her. She went to go see her Lord to anoint the body of her Lord, and it's not there. And she sees the angel sitting on, I guess, the platform where the body was laid. And the angel said to her, why do you look for the, the living among the dead? And then in the story, it says someone else spoke to her, and she thought it was a gardener. And this someone else said to her, if I can imagine, my dear, what are you looking for? Who are you looking for? And, and almost at this point, like her frustration, like, I'm looking for my Lord. Where is her? Start, stop messing around with me. And then the Lord Jesus said in, in the 16th verse, Jesus said to her, Mary. He didn't say anything else. He called her name. And she turned around, and she, it says there, she called uh, 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 Raboni, uh, R uh, which means teacher. She recognized him immediately. My dear brothers and sisters, when we are in our situations of life, and we're staring into a dark tomb, and we're asking questions that we don't know the answers to, where is Christ in this equation? Because oftentimes I think he's talking to us and he's saying, who are you looking for? Because I'm here. And we don't even hear him. But then he calls out to us and he calls us by name and he asks for us. And you know why he calls us by name? Because his, our name is written in his book. Because he died for us. Because we belong to him. He knows you. Do you know him? And as we think about this word a little bit more, I, I think about, especially as we come to communion, how, how many maybe struggle with their own salvation, their own, their own inadequacies that I feel I am not worthy of this grace. I am not worthy of this salvation. The Lord's going to come and I'm not going. This creates doubt as well. But Apostle Paul said in Ephesians, you're saved by grace, not by your own works, not by what I do. We can't earn ourselves into heaven. We're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father. And then it says here later in this chapter, the Lord turned, turned uh, Mary turned to him and wanted to jump into his arms. And Jesus said, wait, I have not yet ascended to my Father. But my dear brothers and sisters, when we come to this realization, when the confusion, the shroud of sin is a, removed from our eyes, isn't that our reaction that we want to jump into the arms of our Lord Jesus Christ? My dearly beloved, this, this word today is not of darkness. It's not of doubt. It's not of unclarity. It's quite the opposite. On a, on a beautiful Easter morning, the sunlight the, the, the clarity of our future and what it means to be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's another example of disciples who were right there, standing next to him, and didn't realize it. They were on the road to Emmaus, and these two disciples were walking, and maybe they also had this shroud of sin and doubt just covering their eyes. They didn't realize that Jesus was walking right next to them. And it always says, what, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another and as you walk and are sad? <laughs> and I, I love the imagery that, just as Mary, that Christ is right next to us in this our situation of life, and we're like, this doesn't make sense, and he's right next to us. He says, why are you sad? And they begin this conversation explaining, are you the only one in the, all of Jerusalem that doesn't know that Jesus died? And so then he starts to talk with them, unpacking and explaining, from beginning with, with Moses and the prophets, how and why this had to happen. And finally, they, they got to where they were going, and they broke bread together, and that's when their eyes were opened, it says, um, their eyes were opened, they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us 
while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us. Every time we come into God's house, he wants to speak with you. He wants to un, un, unpack this amazing and dense plan of salvation that he's been working on. His plan of salvation for you. And we could be sad, we could be despondent, but he calls us to him and says, I, I want to change you from sad to understanding and, and rejoice. And I want to give you the strength as we look and prepare ourselves for Holy Communion. And as just like he did with these, he broke bread with them to strengthen these disciples. The Lord knows we still have a journey to go on. Our journey's not done yet. He hasn't returned yet. We pray every day that it is soon, that it is today. But until then, he gives us the strength for the road ahead. Take advantage of it. Grab hold of it and let, his, let him into your heart so that we can be reoriented, rebalanced, have the proper perspective so that when he returns, he finds us ready, excited. And just as these women sharing this good news, even if others reject it, say, ah, what you talk about is idle foolishness. We know in our hearts of heart, this is the truth. The Lord is coming again. Amen. Amen. For our hymn of repentance, the congregation may remain seated and contemplate the words of our choir as they will sing. We can stand and pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread us <coughs> our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever. Amen. In the commission of my sender, the Apostle, I proclaim unto you the glad tidings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Your sins are forgiven, and the peace of the risen one abide with you. Amen. Amen. Dear amazing Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace, for this beautiful plan of salvation that you have been working on for so long for us, that you sent your Son to this earth to die on the cross for us so that we could have opportunity for eternal life, for this amazing fellowship with you. And we thank you now that we have this opportunity today to have this fellowship with you, this communion, to receive this body and blood of Jesus, to have the same strength that he had to be able to go through so much. Thank you for this opportunity as a congregation that we can come and experience this special moment with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now we shall celebrate Holy Communion. And now the Lord's table is prepared. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I consecrate bread and wine for Holy Communion and lay there upon the once brought, eternally valid sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the Lord took bread and wine, gave thanks, and said, This is my body, which was broken for you. This is my blood of the new covenant, given for many for the remission of sins. Eat and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this wine, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. The body and blood of Jesus given for you. Amen. body and blood of Jesus, given for you. The congregation can be seated. And the Lord now invites you to Holy Communion.
We can stand and close the service in prayer. Dear loving Father, thank you again for this morning that we could spend with you reorienting our lives on this very core understanding and belief that the tomb was empty, that your son arose, and that we have this opportunity for eternal life with you. Please let us grab hold of, your, of this truth and that we can be firm in our faith and knowing that you are always right there next to us. Bless the offering and the sacrifices that have been brought. You see all things. Blessed that it can bring forth a transformation in our hearts to be more like your son. And bless the, this congregation and your church that we can continue to, on this path of salvation, complete your work, Father. Send your son soon and prepare us for this day, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you for everyone joining us. We can have our closing anthem. Our closing hymn, the congregation is invited to join our choir in singing from the folder number 50, The Lord is My Light. <laughs> 